I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's hour-long conversation. We'll have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm aware that we have folks from different cities in the United States, West Coast of the United States, Berlin, and other capitals in Europe, and even a little bit elsewhere. So thank you for your time, your busy schedule. I'm looking forward to this. I've looked forward to this for three weeks now. Uh, we have Michael Kimmage of Catholic University, who has kindly written for us before uh, in the position to properly introduce and moderate and lead the conversation with our VIP guest, Hedwig Richter from Berlin. She is a German historian. The conversation will, uh, I think, end up being wide ranging, but it's focused on a book from 2020 in English, my translation, Democracy, a German Affair. Michael, thank you for holding up the book. Um, it stirred quite a debate in Germany. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Hedwig, Michael, I don't think it's yet been translated into English. It should be translated into English. You can tell me more about that update or, or correct me in just a moment. But, but it's a book that deserves a, a good deal of attention across the Atlantic for a number of different reasons. I'll stop there. Michael is going to lead a conversation for the first half, and then he will entertain questions through raised hand or in chat. The second half, Hedvig, welcome. Michael, thank you for creating this program for us. Well, thank you so much to you, Jeff, and to you, Michelle, for making this uh, possible and, and for hosting us here on this, uh, on this, on this platform. I'm Michael Kimmage, as Jeff mentioned, professor of history at Catholic University, and it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Hedvig Richter to this group, professor of history as well, uh, but at the University of the Bundeswehr in Munich. I first met Hedvig, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but I do remember that it was at a party on Swan Street in Washington, D.C., which at the time had so many Germans living on it that we referred to it as Schwanstrasse. Uh, so you know, I met Hedwig at a Schwanstrasse party, and uh, I remember her speaking about her research project at the German Historical Institute at the time, which was to look at a sort of election processes, election results, electoral structures in the U.S. and Germany and in other countries. And it seemed to me like a wonderfully well-focused, uh, rich research topic then, but I couldn't have anticipated that from that acorn the tree would grow. That's really not just a study of electoral processes, fresh rethinking of German history from the 18th century to the present. And it's just been, for me, uh, wonderful to see the progression of this research project on the one hand, but also uh, the voice that Hedwig has acquired in Germany uh, as part of many public debates, as Jeff uh, has mentioned, and also to see the nature of this contribution. It's my firm conviction that books of history should take on the general public, that they should take on big questions, and that they should venture big answers to the big questions with all of the risks uh, that that entails. And I can't think of a book that does so in a way more ambitiously and more uh, productively than Demokratie, the Deutsche Affäre, which I fervently hope to see in English at some point and uh, as a presence in sort of English language, American uh, intellectual life. But until then, we'll have to make do with these kinds of conversations. Uh, and so, you know, with that in mind, I just want to delve into a couple of questions of the book and then a few questions about the topic of democracy in the present tense and how it is that Hedwig addresses this as a scholar, but also uh, as, a, as a public intellectual. Now, going just again into my own, you know, sort of, in the autobiographical mode, just a little bit further, I remember when I first started to study German history, I was an exchange student in Germany at the age of 16 in August of 1989, and then from then studied German, German history in college and in other venues. What I do acutely remember is that this whole question of democracy in German history was largely approached as a kind of absence, that the point was to understand that which was missing. And I think we all know the term Zonderweg, which implies that there's a kind of historical path, perhaps in an Anglo-American one. And the burden of those trying to understand German history is to understand the deviation from that path, which is sort of another version of 
of absence. And so the question was, why did 1848 not culminate in a properly liberal polity in Germany? And then the question is, why does the Kaiserreich not yield a kind of genuine democracy? And Weimar can be put in the democratic category, but it's always presented, I think, a little bit like the musical cabaret as something sort of shaky and and on the edge of collapsing. Nazi period obviously dominates, I think, the American understanding of German history. That's not an absence, that's a presence. And it too raises the question of why democracy didn't take root in Germany. Of course, after 1945, the question becomes different. And certainly then it's possible to debate and discuss the evolution of German democracy. But that's as of 1945, in the version of German history that I absorbed as, you know, sort of a a young person coming to this subject. I wanted to begin there, Hilvik, and sort of to ask you about reigning interpretations, the sort of dominant interpretations of German history, particularly regarding this question of democracy. Not quite to get to your book, but how did you arrive at these questions? What were the sort of frameworks that you had prior to writing the book? Yeah, actually, it was like that, as you as you described, that um, that there was all, always no democracy in Germany and um, that it just started kind of in 1945 and that even the Weimar Republic didn't really count because it failed. And so um, it, it was like this, um, it was not only an economical miracle in, in the early um, Republic of Germany, but it was also this democratic miracle that out of nothing, um, the dem democracy evolved. And um, I, I started to become interested in elections when I studied um, East German history. I, I worked on churches in East Germany for my PhD, and then I realized that they made a big deal of um, elections, in elections in socialism. And I thought, that's, a, that's really interesting. Why was it such a big deal? Because we, we, everybody knew how, how these elections ended with 99%. Um, and then some then I realized that one function of the elections in socialism was to discipline people. Um, and then I, I became really interested in elections. What do they mean? What do they mean in democracies? What do they mean in, in, in dictatorships? And I thought it must be interesting to study the history of elections. And then I started to, um, for my second book, to um, study the elections in Germany, in Prussia. Uh, and in the 19th century compared to United States. And I thought this must be interesting because Prussia was this not democracy. And then United States, of course, um, a democracy also in the 19th century. Um, and then I found it very, very interesting that, um, that there are a lot of parallels in the 19th century. Um, for example, in the beginning of the 19th century, um, elections very often were introduced from above, not only in Prussia, and in Prussia, there were a lot of elections, which, which was kind of surprising because we never read about them. Um, and 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 the um, the governments took the elections very serious and kind of forced people to go to the elections. And then I found that it was very similar in other um, um, European countries, and that in the United States, um, uh, it, elections were um, introduced kind of from the parties. They tried to bo to to broaden the broaden the the, the, the suffrage, and uh, so it was not the people who fought to get the suffrage, but it was top down because it was very helpful for governments to have elections to um, also to discipline people, but also to bind them to the nation, to bind them to the um, to the community. And um, yeah, and 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 I I I went to the archives in the United States, in many archives, and in 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 Germany for Prussia. But I also read literature about elections in other countries, and I found it always again um, very um, amazing how parallel the history um, of Western countries was in the nineteenth century. I could bring some other examples, but perhaps I come later mm. to them. Wonderful. So this notion of parallelism certainly comes across very you know, sort of very fluently and insightfully in the, uh, in, in the book, um, not that Germany isn't unique, but uh, that web of connections is laid out, you know, very, very, um, very productively, I would, I would say. I wanted to ask, before getting into sort of a few different historical periods, ask you to comment on an aspect of the book that I found certainly striking, and this was the notion of human worth 
as it's linked to democracy. So you know, sort of voting and parties is, is, is one thing, but human worth is, is almost a larger, more philosophical notion. The role that the body plays in the research that you do and democracies that grant certain freedoms uh, of the body, but also can constrain the body. That's another prominent theme in the book. And then thirdly, women's participation in politics. It does seem to me that when you look into this subject in the 19th century, that it does really shift the debate and change the way that we understand perhaps German politics in general, but also German democracy in particular. So if you could just comment a bit on those three notions, human worth, the importance of looking historically at the body in relation to politics, and then thirdly, women's participation in politics as one of the key themes of, of modern German history. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, uh, yeah, um, I when I when I um, uh, uh, studied um, the, the history of democracy and the history of elections, um, I found it um, amazing that it was self-evident that women were not enclosed, that women were um, did not have the the right to vote, and um, there were of, of of course there were always um, um, some um, voices who said women should also have the right to vote, like Olympe de Gouges during the French Revolution, and um, also in the United States in Europe you always have some single voices um, um, in favor of women's suffrage. But all in all, it was um, very clear and very obvious and very self. Um, um, understanding that that women didn't have the right to vote, and I found this really um, why why is it? Because everybody spoke of equality and um, um, the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment forced people to think about traditions. But why didn't they think about the um, the, the about gender and the order of gender? And then I um, thought it is this is quite similar to um, um, black people to slaves in the United States. And also to rural people for um, quite a long time in the first half um, of the 19th century, um, um, farmers, um, um, peasants, um, people who lived in um, rural areas didn't have the right to vote, also in the United States, but also in, um, in, in most of Europe. And what these groups, and there are some other groups, have in common is that they don't rule over their own body. They, 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 they were hungry. They didn't have enough to eat, for example, rural people. They didn't, very often they were not, um, um, they couldn't read or write. Um, they could be beaten up. Women didn't really own their own body. They, they, they had very um, precarious um, rights to possess anything anyway. And, um, and also this is the same with, um, with slaves. And I think to... Um, a person that doesn't rule over his or her own body can be taken as a political subject. And so, and, and I think it goes hand in hand that um, people had the means to live a, a, a good, meaningful um, um, life with, um, um, with um, enough to eat it, for everything you need, um, um, everything the body needs to have a good life um, uh, to to um, be enclosed politically. So this is, it, you can't be um, enclosed in, in politically, you can't be integrated if you're not somehow socially integrated so that you can live a, a proper life. So I think this is a very strong connection to, um, to social questions. And you always see these social, uh, social questions connected to the history um, of, of democracy. And yeah, and very often I don't understand why people say, oh, the history of democracy is mainly a history of ideas. And but I, I think this always goes very strongly um, um, together. And with the body and with the questions, why were peasants, why were farmers excluded? Um, you have very, um, you find an answer um, and you find the connection to, to the body. So three further historical questions and then one final question about the present moment. But the first is, is a very broad one. I understand and it and it follows from what you just said a moment ago about notions of autonomy and and human worth as they relate to democracy and to politics but if i understand your book correctly i think that there's a progression from the 18th century until 1933 obviously that's a a year in which a great deal changes in germany but a progression from the 18th century to 1933 that somewhat resembles a story of progress not exactly linear there are 
shifts and curves and there's the first world war and steps forward and steps backward but there is a kind of progress that's being achieved in those decades <laughs> i just want to ask if that's a correct reading of your book and if so in what ways you understand that progression toward uh, perhaps greater norms of, of of human worth in in germany at that time yeah um it's actually um i there are many historians who say there is no progress at all. Progress is an old-fashioned concept and how, how can one speak about progress? And very often um, um, uh, women historians um, uh, or historians of, of women's history say um, there is no real progress. It's still terrible. And then I say, well, women have the suffrage and women have the right to vote. And um, I, I, I think it's not, it's not correct. Just because we um, rightfully um, question this progress histories and this teleological histories, of course we have to 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 have a closer look and to criticize it. But then, if we um, 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 all in all, I think we can't deny that there is a progress. And I think one of the most interesting um, progresses you can see at the end of the nineteenth century is that societies became mass societies. Um, and this is one of the parallels. I, I uh, one one of the really amazing examples um, I, I, I want to show you um, of, of the international parallels in the history of democracy. In in only a, a few years around 1870, there was, for example, the, in Great Britain the Reform Act of 1867, which doubled the number of eligible voters, and then. The first German nation state introduced universal male suffrage between 1867 and then 1871. The French Third Republic was proclaimed, proclaimed in 1870, and there were reforms in Sweden, Belgium, Netherlands, Norway, and so forth, and so forth. And of course, um, shortly after Germany introduced the male universal suffrage, um, also the United States introduced um, the, the amendments um, uh, um, uh, universal male suffrage. And and this was the foundation for um, for political inclusion for men, but this had to go hand in hand with economical developments. And in 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 the in the um, uh, years before the First World War, um, let's say around um, 1880 to to the First World War, it um, um, uh, people became had more and more means to to live a good life. And men, for example, had um, um, had enough time in in Germany. There was introduced a ten hour day, um, uh, and and uh, they and men had enough time to participate in in parties, and they had enough money to buy a beer, to sit together in the evening, to to um, to discuss um, the speeches held in the in the German Parliament. And I could see these developments also in in other countries. So this is really a time of great inclusion of um, mass politicization. Um, and I think here you can see very well how this how all comes together with um, um, more more well um, um, uh, the, the social question was was a big question of the time and everybody tried to help poor and to help workers um, and it was at the same time it was really um, a, a big time of democratization though of course in Germany um, there was no democracies like in most other countries. Well, Jeff, I do hope you recommend the book to your friend and colleague, Francis Fukuyama, uh, who I think would read it with great interest. And there is, I think, something of a concordance, not between, not exactly between his scholarship and yours, Hedvig, but I, I suspect that there is a bit of a point of commonality in terms of a Hegelian notion of history of the need yeah. for recognition and the sort of the, the ways in which that can, uh, you know, sort of move move forward but uh, that's maybe a potential future conversation that we could have in uh in this kind of format because i would love to get his his response to uh, to these to these arguments uh to to jump forward in time to 1933 so 1933 to 1945 uh you know you you cover many familiar areas in those in those chapters the the atrocities committed by the national socialists the devastation of democracy and and, and none of that it's necessary for the history of the book, but none of that comes as a great surprise. But I think there were two elements of those passages on the Nazi period that came as a surprise uh, to me. And if, if I, again, if I'm not paraphrasing correctly, please just let me know. But I, I had the impression that you characterized the German population as less warlike uh, than the Nazis may have wished, uh, that that was one area where they really had to push uh, the society toward 
war. And then the second aspect that I found surprising, uh, very intuitive when you later talk, but surprising, is this sort of shine démocratie was there on the part of the Nazis. And perhaps that came a bit from your research into East German elections, but these sort of quasi-democratic rituals of voting and and sort of party formation and democratic legitimate, legitimation uh, that were taking place in, 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 a, in a polity that was very obviously not democracy. If we had time, we could sort of turn to Putin's Russia, which I think is in some respects uh, similar. It sort of bows to aspects of democracy while being fundamentally undemocratic. But I wanted to ask you about your understanding of the Nazi, of the, of the Nazi period and how the argument of the book moves forward through these, these traumatic years. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, first of all, I want to say, and I, I think you can't um, write German history um, without the horizon of 1933. I, I think this is very, very important. And of course, the question why in 1933 and why Germany is so important. And um, and I think it's always present. For me, it's always present. And but I think it's the the Sonderweg is the in, easy answer. And and um, I must also stress that most of, of historians, um, even since 1980, say that the Sonderweg is over because it doesn't make any sense um, th um, theoretically, um, because what is the normal way if this is the Sonderweg and then this theological um, thinking that all history comes only to 1933. So um, I think that the question why 1933 and why um, Germany becomes much more difficult if you um, don't have a Sonderweg, if you don't say there was this crazy German people and of course they were, they lived under the Pickelhaube during the Kaiserreich and then they, they, they didn't have another chance, they didn't have any chance then to become Nazis. And interestingly, um, many Nazis took the Sonderweg um, notions after 1945 to tell the, the Allies and the Americans, um, look, I was a German. Could I do? Um, of course, I didn't know what is a democracy. Um, and so I think this is one of the reasons why the Sonderweg is so, so very attractive, um, not in, in research, but still in, in public today, because it's such a, um, 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 it, it's just such an easy answer to why, why 1933. And I think it's it's more difficult to explain it if you see that there are long, long um, German traditions of parliamentarism, long, long German traditions of election. For example, in in South Germany, you, you had some German countries in the first half of the nineteenth century. The suffrage was there was much broader than in the United States, and so the Germans knew what is parliament and knew what is um, elections. They knew all these games, and they they and and when. And then they had a democracy during um, the Weimar Republic, and in 1933 they knew what they was what they were destroying. These were not stupid Nazis who didn't know else, who, who didn't know um, what they do. I think it's it's it is so it's such a tragic um, um, tragedy that that um, that they really had these these um, um, democratic experiences, and I think. Um, one of, of of course of many many explanations is that um, Nazis and also these different forms of fascism they didn't come out of authoritarian monarchies like you had in the 19th century but they came out of democracies and um, out of failed democracies and because they needed mass societies and what I found I I I did, I did a lot of research especially um, um around the years of 1900 these years of mass politicization and mass um um, um, uh, um, societies, the formation of mass societies. And I think what you can see there is that on the one hand, it is a democratization. People were included and more and more people could um, participate in political life, in social life, and more and more people had a good life. Um, but at the same time, this is a, a time of great exclusion. And people felt better and felt more equal if they could look down on Jews, for example. Anti-Semitism came up. Rac racism was was um, a very strong. And in the United States, for example, this was the time where um, lynching had a peak, um, um, and where ra racism was um, uh, incredibly um, terrible. And I think this is not um, um, this is not by chance, but this belongs together. And democracy. On the one hand, can be this in inclusion form, but on the other hand, it can be um, it, it can um, can develop to uh, fascism or to national socialism, and 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 the national socialists like the fascists, they knew they had to 
um, uh, they, they couldn't just um, throw away all those um, means that, that the people knew. And so they held elections and they still had the parliament. Um, and Hitler very often explained to journalists and, and journalists of the New York Times, we are very fascinated by that um, through the 30s, um, that, that, um, uh, that Hitler said, we are a real democracy. And then whenever they had held elections, it was really um, a, a fest. It was a, it was a huge party and, and, um, and you should read the articles in the New York Times about it. But um, uh, it, it, it was a, sh a show and music and um, whatever they could, could do with all this, um, um, with all the propaganda. And, um, and, and the, the meaning of course was the message was, look, um, um, people re actually vote for Hitler. And um, we, we are a democracy in the sense that that this is Hitler's people. This is this is um, um, that that is legitimate. The, the Hitler is legitimized. And and for, for a, um, a couple of years, it really worked. And and in foreign countries, they were very um, um, impressed. And in the New York Times, they wrote, "Oh, we think it's a, it's a dictatorship, and it's only fake elections." But but people really um, vote for Hitler. And actually. Um, um, uh, a, a most likely oh, way over 90% actually voted for Hitler. And of course, there was also um, suppression of, of vote and of course of, of free speech. But still um, um, in, 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 the, in the early 30s, mid 30s, people were really um, impressed by Hitler. And so it, it, um, for the Nazis, it really made sense to make this um, kind of democracy. And I, I think to have this part of the, of the history, I think we shouldn't exclude this part of the history of democracy um, so that we can be aware of um, the dangers of democracy. Um, um, and there is not this slight, wonderful Western history of democracy and then this very strange German Sonderweg, but um, um, yeah, fascism and national socialism came um, out of democracies. That does take me, I think, quite naturally to my final historical question. The book is published in 2020, I mean, early in the 1970s, you had David Blackburn and Ely saying that mm -hmm. in the post-war period, it's sort of Britain that's unusual and Germany that's the sort of stable, prosperous democracy. But certainly in those four years, 2016 to 2020, we had the, the phrase always a, a little bit ridiculous, a sort of Germany is the last remaining leader of the free world and, um, you know, sort of hyperbolic expectations of the demise of, of American democracy. But certainly that was all in the air in the years in which you were uh, finalizing the book. But it's not so much that that I have in mind. I mean, I think that your book takes on what's a question that's on par, really, with the question of, as you say, the sort of crucial year of 1933, which is how do you explain the longevity of democracy, the stability of it, in many ways, the success of democracy in Germany, West Germany, and then in a unified Germany after 1990, 1991. How do you explain that from, you know, sort of 1945, uh, to the present, because it is a prominent issue. It matters a lot for Europe. It matters a lot for the U.S. and for U.S. foreign policy. It's a sort of a major aspect of the post-war world is the stability and the heft of, of, of German democracy. And it seems to me like that's where your book is such an extraordinary contribution, contribution because it's explaining something that's before our eyes. I think we kind of take it for granted now that this is what Germany is it's not that the Nazi period is fading away, but uh, you know the the last seventy years are very much uh, in the foreground. And I'm curious how you try to explain this aspect of of, of Germany. Obviously, not everything that you write about post for 1945 Germany is celebratory. I mean, that's 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 yeah, not the case yeah. at all with your book. But there is a way in which this is the sort of final part of the story. It's not a book that ends in 1945. It goes much further. So that's my last historical question. Sort of the 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 analysis that you offer of post. Second World War German democracy. Yeah, um, I think the the, the common um, answers are, are also right. Um, um, like the Western uh, West Allies and especially um, United States, they really did a great job. As I, I think this is very very important, and you 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 can't deny it. I, well, whatever they did, perhaps not everything, but most of it was really um, it, it was just um, um, smart and. It really helped Germany to um, to accept it, and then of course we had the Cold War. Germany was in Germany was integrated because of the Cold War, um, 
And then very important, the economy, um, which is always so important for democracies. Um, uh, we should always have this in mind. And um, this is also the big question. How can we make the, the big e ecological transformation and, um, uh, um, and keep the economy somehow um, working? But then I also think um, that Germany, but also um, uh, the other countries in Europe really took their lessons um, from fascism and of course, especially from national socialism. And there's this wonderful book from Martin Conway. Um, he wrote about uh, um, um, continental Europe after 1945 um, until the 60s. And he said, it is so impressing, um, or he writes it is how it is impressing that um, these countries really learned from, um, um, from the big disaster from two world wars and then from the collapse of democracies. And he said, it, um, uh, they, all of these countries installed um, very strong top-down constitutions and um, they, they uh, didn't really trust the people. And, um, um, and, and it, 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 these democracies and, and the constitutions were quite technocratic. Of course, these were democracies, but still it was a very strong top down. And I think this is very, very interesting that democracies can be strongly top down in, 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 in terrible um, crises, in, 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 st in strong crises. And perhaps this is something which would be um, interesting for the United States, where it's top down, um, it does not have a good image. But then um, um, a, a last answer, and I think this is uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps this is the most important part, is that Germany um, had these long traditions of, of um, democracy. And I think you never can come from outside and install a democracy. It, this just won't work. It would not have worked in Germany in 1945 if they didn't have um, um, these long, long histories over way over 100 years of parliamentarism, of elections, of um, um, uh, election um, uh, campaigns and, and so forth, of, also of constitutions. Um, so in, after the First World War in Germany, I, 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 um, I researched that elections were very, um, very self-evident. People didn't really question it. It was just a thing they knew. And this was exactly the same after the, uh, the Second World War. Um, um, in, in the, in the um, East German history, I found that many people, when, when, the, when the dictatorship began in East Germany, that they wrote um, to the governments, um, uh, what are you doing? This is the same what Hitler did. So they were very well aware of that there was something wrong in Nazi Germany, but they knew exactly what is, a, what is, really, what is a real election and how does it work and that they have a right to have um, uh, real elections and democracy. Well, it's, it's, it's an elegant answer because it's where your book comes full circle and where the 18th, late 18th and 19th century components modify the post-1945 components and, and form the book into a a very, very satisfying and I would add persuasive narrative. I'm going to hold off on my final question because I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Please just raise your hand or if you prefer to send uh, if you prefer to send in questions to the chat function, that's fine as well. I will try to catch everybody's hands. I see one up from Lawrence Haas, so the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Great discussion. And uh, I do hope your book comes out in English because uh, I do not speak or read German. Um, I was, since you did so much research that was comparative, you said you looked closely at the United States and you also did a lot of reading about other countries. Um, when I see discussion about trends in democracy, I tend to see them on, as I read, um, there's one school of thought in which democracy, the, the movement toward democracy and also the movement against democracy tends to be global and contagious. That is, it starts somewhere, you see these massive trends like, you know, Huntington's theory of waves of democracy. And then on the other hand, um, you, you see a lot of commentary about countries and their cultures and, and which cultures are amenable to democracies and which ones aren't. And I'm, I'm inspired to ask you this question by what I'm seeing going on right now in Iran, Russia, and China, and the question about whether without overstating that, whether there is this tension between the fact that there's some sort of a contagious thing in the air, and yet these are very different countries that have not experienced consistent democracy, and in some cases, any democracy. So I'm just wondering if you could just discuss this question of global trends versus cultural 
peculiarities in individual countries and sort of where you come out on the importance of both? Yeah, um, um, I always tend to say that it's it's both, or it's 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 um, um, of course there's always never only one reason. It's never only the ideas. It's never only the econo economy. Economy. I, I I really think it's very important to have it together, and um, I think um, culture really matters. Um, it is very very important that um, a country has a tradition of democracies, and um, um, I can only repeat it that in Germany it would never have worked after 1945 if there would not have been this very long history of democratic um, experience. But then um, also, of course, it is important to have the um, economical um, um, framework that, that that tells people to accept democracy and that they see that they have a good life in in democracy. Um, um, and I, I, I think um, the the impression that it is uh, contagious that that like for example you see um, populism rising everywhere. I think very often you can find some um, some some of the some parallel in these countries. Like um, um, I think what 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 we now experience is this um, that we all face the an ecological transformation we somehow have to deal with, and for many people it's it's just much more comfortable to vote um, crazy to say no I don't have to change anything we don't have to change anything, and that it is really a big driver of um, populism and I think very often you find those um, structural um, reasons for. Um, 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 for uh, yeah, for the rise of of uh, populism. But then, what you also can see is that in countries without um, uh, 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 democratic traditions, it's it's very hard to to um, to install democracy. And and I think, for example, in East Eastern Europe, um, Eastern Middle Europe, it's um, really it's not amazing that they have prob problems with democracy because they don't have a very long um, history of democracy and. Um, and quite optimistic. I think these these troubles they have um, um, with democracy is, is is kind of normal. Um, it it would have been amazing if they wouldn't have any problems uh, with their new democracy. And I I think it's it's still they're still on the path um, to learn it. And um, and in Russia, of course, we see um, they also don't have a, a longer history of democracy. And and now it really looks like um, um, they won't make it. They don't have the framework of the European Union, which is very, very helpful for um, for Poland, for example, or Hungary. Um, and so it it can go this direction or this direction um, in Eastern European countries with um, problems with democracy. I hope this kind of answers your question. Well, the floor is very much open for questions. And I see a second question from... Fritz Heinzen. So, Mr. Heinzen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, I really must admit, I, I enjoy your book, and it's, it, it really is quite fascinating. I wish I had it back when I was teaching, because especially when I teach World War I, I, I you finally coined a term, prism of World War II, or prism of Nazism, because the, the Kaiser was proto-Hitler, and everything was all leading to Hitler, and this was leading to Hitler. And then of course, students would try to take it back and say, well, Bismarck is leading to, and, and, and then on and on and on. So this, this is, it's a wonderful corrective, and I do hope this is available in English someday. But my question is this, and it, 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 it comes to the fact that maybe there is a Zonderweg in, in Germany, but it's not what everybody thinks it is. And I think maybe it's the, his, the historical strata. And I say that in plural because I've seen the reaction in Die Zeit and elsewhere, all, all these reactions to your book. And I think back to the 1980s, the late 80s, and that historical stride. And is there something maybe unique about German historiography and German historians where I think you're brought into a much more, um, well, you, you're, you, you're brought up, up and out into public in a way that American historians and, and, other, and, and historians in many other countries aren't. And so I'm curious if, if you think there's sort of a, a uniqueness to German historiography, and then is that good or, or, or bad? How, how does that impact? Because it does impact then your writing and, and how it's accepted. And in fact, I mean, I've seen the, you know, there are wild claims that the AFD can, can take your book and run with it and, and all kinds of, Wild notions. So I'll leave it at that. 
Wirklich, es, es ist die, die, die Sonderstreitfrage. Sonderstreitfrage, ja. Ja. Well, um, I, I, I think it's good that Germans are always very careful that they are, um, that they kind of distrust everybody is he or she a Nazi. But sometimes I think it really doesn't make any sense. I, I think I have some very clear, um, Thesis, um, um, you can talk about um, some 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 very distinguished I ideas, and it it just didn't make any sense. You can nowhere in my book you can find any Nazi um, yeah. thinking. So this really, this really didn't help. I I, I can't really ex explain what's going on. I it, it's it, it, at least it's um there was a big discussion and many people also supported it. Also many colleagues supported it and um. So you can say this helped the book to 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 see um, um, that there was a broader audience, but but I really thought that this was. I I, I think that that um, perhaps two or three colleagues um, they were very angry that I um, um, challenged the Sonderweg history, and um, because they think they they also fight with some younger historians who who work on the Weimar Republic and who say the Weimar Republic really had a chance. It wasn't this this um, only this failed democracy. It really had um, good years, and um, and and these two or three historians they were very angry also about these um, um, scholars who worked on the Weimar Republic. And I think their start was um, that I that I said there is a huge tradition of German democracy, and um, and to to make to to um, make me mundtot. What I what I, what what does it mean, um, Michael? Um, to to, to the silence or to uh, silence? Yes, um, to silence me. Um, the, the best thing to silence somebody in Germany is to say, "Oh, you're a Nazi." Yeah, and so um, I, I think this this perhaps this this explains, but um, um, I, I luckily it didn't. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't really convincing to to. Uh, well, bad reviews are the next best thing to a good review, uh, <laughs> and, and so it, it does. If you don't mind saying, or if your publisher doesn't mind you saying, can you say how many copies are sold? I'm I'm very curious based on all the reaction I've seen. Um. No, I'm, I actually don't really know. It, it must be a lot, but the the, the publisher never um, never releases the the numbers. So, um, but but it has a um, a fourth edition and then also some special editions. And now it will it will, it will be um, ed edited by um, as a paperback next year. So it must be it, something. There's a question from the chat, Hedwig. I want to make sure that you address, and it's about the. The kinds of criticisms that were 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 made about the book, and maybe I mean you mentioned these sort of outlandish ones that you you, you can't really explain. But uh, uh, what about the the not outlandish criticisms? Is there a way of paraphrasing that for 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 our our viewership? The sort of objections you mentioned the one about the Weimar Republic. But, uh, maybe you could just fill in the audience here. Um. Um. The what was the criticism? Sort of the of the people who objected, given that there was a sort of public debate about it. The, yeah, the... yeah. So the the main point actually was that I um um that I challenged the Sonderweg, which was strange because I always said um research uh, starting in the nineteen eighties with Jeff Ely um um I says that there is no German Sonderweg, and then there were huge um, um research programs who, for example, showed that the German um, uh, a middle class was not weak. This was is a very important um, um, part of the German Sonderweg that there was no Bürgertum, no middle class, because all of them only were Untertan. They were just um, um, devote subjects. Um, and research showed that this is just not not true. And then there's um, the wonderful work of Margaret Anderson. I hope all of you know her, a great American historian. Who um, um, she was the first who really had to look on the German elections in. Oh yes, great. Um, in the in the um, Kaiserreich, and she showed that these elections were powerful and meaningful, and that the parliament was was powerful parliament and so forth. And so there is this long research tradition. And I said, look, this is the research tradition. But then some, I, I would really say this is it, it's a small minority, but a very loud minority. They they were so angry about me because I also got um, a lot of. Um, public um, interest. So I, it was beyond the um, research interest, beyond the, the historian community. And I think, that, and some of them um, said it's so dangerous that she's saying um, that there's this democratic history and we really have to fight this. And 
And they connected the belief in the Sonderweg um, with um, regretting National Socialism or taking um, 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 the um, um, for, for um, um, to take the responsibility for National Socialism. They said. Um, if you don't believe in the Sonderweg, then you don't take responsibility for national socialism, which, which is really doesn't make any sense um, and, 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 and for historians. Um, but, but, but I think this was somehow the, the, the connection. It was in some respects remarkably comic that it would be dangerous to write about the history of German democracy. It's, 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 it's a wonderfully comic, uh, a comic notion. Just as a footnote, the, the idea of a Sonderweg, it just means a separate past. That was a popular idea, as, as Hedwig is, is suggesting, is a popular way of looking at German history as sort of fundamentally prejudiced in favor of what happened in and after 1933. And you know, the same way that you could thematize American history as exceptional, you can thematize German history as exceptional, but in this sense, kind of negatively exceptional. And it's a very entrenched uh, way of looking at. Uh, German history. I would underscore before we turn to our next two questions, what you mentioned also about the kind of book that it is. I don't think that when Jill Lepora published her book on American history, which I think is a great book, too many Americans, academics or otherwise, objected to the fact that it was a big synthetic narrative history. I think that's a little bit more common here in the US than it may be in Germany, where the divide between quotation marks popular history and academic history is a little bit more a little bit more rigid, and I think that they were perhaps yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, actually, this was one critic criticism that it is so easy to read it. So it it was really, and many um, Anglo-Saxon colleagues then reached out to me and said, "Wow, this is uh, this is an amazing criticism." Um, and um, yeah, it, it 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 was really, it was kind of weird. Yes, well, the criticism is is on its surface is is correct. It is a dangerously easy book to. Uh, Dangerously easy book to read. I'll, I'll concur to that to uh, <laughs> the critics of, of this book. Uh, Eric, Tim, you've been waiting patiently. Let's let's turn to, to you, Mr. Tim, and, and, and then, Jack, we can take your question after that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am going to take advantage of the uh, situation and uh, share a patient of mine and see what uh, Hedwig uh, thinks of it. Um, being told my internet connection is unstable. Do you guys hear me okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, well, I've been watching, uh, I'm, I'm here from uh, Montreal. We had the uh, trucker convoy in Ottawa in January, February. It was uh, pretty great when stops. There were things involved, uh, border crossing, so. So it's okay. I'm uh, involved with the Canadian equivalent of the SPD, the NDP, the New Democratic Party here. I'm on the executive committee in a writing, so I've been involved with it for four years. I'm, I'm really concerned about the, uh, the uh, threat to liberal democracy. Um, I'm on a call with someone called Ruth Van Diat, good on strongman politics. Uh, she's out of New York University every Friday. She does the Zoom talk about this. No one's really quite sure what to do. She says the Democratic Party is not known for standing up for this kind of thing. Republicans, obviously, are doing a brilliant job what they're trying to do. Um, and occurred to me, and we are now, recently, I'm in uh, Quebec, uh, where we had a provincial election, and we're dealing with um, uh, attacks and threats, threats of physical violence against politicians. This is going on all over the place, in the states, rampant. Um, people in the health system to you, elections, officials to you name it, that in Arizona this morning. Um, and uh, it occurs to me that you shouldn't be leaving it up to politicians. Um, I'm a fan of politicians, by the way. Um, uh, especially liberal democratic politicians who know that people can look at the same set of facts, come up with a really different uh, sense of what does that mean? This liberal democratic debate is about everybody deal facts. Um, I think that it's not up to them to necessarily defend system. Political violence against politicians would be a great opportunity to stand up and say, you know what? Politicians drive me nuts. They're mine. 
I reserve the right to complain about them. God damn it, leave them alone. Mess with them, you'll be, less, you'll be messing with me. I don't think the public is ready for that. I think that's where we need to go. That on some level, we need to step outside of politics in order to protect liberal democracy. Public has to now step up. I mean, they're going to have to, this is, has, will have to be explained, articulated. Um, and because as it is, I'm going to shut up now. Uh, uh, politicians who stand up for this, of which there are not many in Canada, and certainly not the left, we're still obsessed with if you're a conservative, you're a terrible person. Ridiculous. Um, be, where am I going here? I think they're, they're not, they're not there. And when they are there, it's a standard moral democracy. My friends on the left say, you know what, they're just standing up for the status quo. And, you know, it's just, they just, uh, uh, they choose, they're just taking advantage of that discourse for political purposes. It's partisan. Politicians will come across as partisan if they stand up for liberal democracy. But I think public is not partisan. We need, that's where we need to go. We need a movement, a citizens movement that will include parties and anybody else who wants to sign maybe a petition but we are here for the system, for process, for intelligent discussion. And that's what parliamentary democracy is about. And now that Messi and we want that process to remain intact, that will be teased out, fatchets, and anybody else who is a little bit milk folks on it still say. That's my thought. And I'm wondering, am I in Claude Coupoule here or what? Is, is there a question to answer? Well, what is the question I have to answer? Oh, am I? No, the question I, I think that the, the sound transmission was a little yeah. tricky. I think it's strains and stresses on liberal democracy and in what ways it's, 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 it's sort of necessary and valuable to stand up for the system as such, as opposed to political causes and, uh, and, and personalities. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yes, sir. I, I totally agree. We have to stand up for liberal democracy. And I think we, we, um, uh, now we are all well aware that um, the liberal democracy is not, uh, um, um, it's not self-evident. We really have to fight for it. And, um, and I think what we learned from history is that um, it, it, the democracies um, are, are always, have always um, this, this, um, the possibility of, of becoming um, populist um, uh, forms of government or fascist forms of government or uh, national socialist forms of government. And um, yeah, we are not safe. The uh, United States is not safe because it's a democracy. Yeah, I think that's an important point. You think the fact that Germany has a history of coalition governing will make it easier for socialist conservatives, liberals to have respect for each other? Because in Canada, we don't. We don't. Still in this very competitive sense of how we operate in parliament and we don't realize that for the this time we need to pull together we're not used to cooperating we leave it to the system to keep everything civil now we have to step outside of it you're following my my line of thought that to this in germany it seems to me you're used to it what do you, what do you think of that stand yeah, together it's uh, of course, it, it, this is a whole discussion about um, proportional representation and um, um, uh, the winner takes it all. Um, and yeah, I, I think that there are many um, uh, good things um, uh, in, in favor of um, uh, proportional representation, um, but, but it also has its, its um, dark sides. Yeah, but I, I, I would say it, it really helps. It, it also helps to, to have a better, um, um, yeah, to, to work together. And if you have uh, problems like like now in, in, in Europe, the, the, um, uh, the war on Ukraine um, or like the um, um, ecological crisis, um, um, you, it, it's better if pa parties um, come together. Jack, last but certainly not least, your question, then Hedvig, if you have any closing thoughts, I think you can attach them to your answer to Jack's question. Jack, the, the floor is here. Well, well my, Michael, thank you. With the clock running, I, I'm here to hear you two close this out. I will ask the very concrete question, where things stand on finding a publisher in Britain or the United States so that we can have this available in English. And, and Jack James, I think I just saw your hand up a moment ago. Do you, would you like to jump in with the last question? Yeah, sure. I, I'm glad that I could do that just briefly. I don't want to... Um, uh, Riley, uh, Jeff's good question. I was just thinking, is, do you think that there is a, um, 
a kind of exciting vendor in the sense of what you have done um, in terms of talking about the culture of remembrance. Um, there's a fascinating piece in The Atlantic this week from Clint Smith about the, the dealing with the uh, imp impossible, I believe it was called. And it's all about the cultural remembrance in Germany and the United States. And I wonder if you think that the, what, what lessons you have learned in your book, which you also stress that we have to look at in an international way uh, at democracy and its origins and evolutions. I was curious what you learned about the United States, because I've seen you in a lot of talk shows talking about that subject as well. Yeah, a few thoughts about the U.S. And, and, and the culture of remembrance, and then it would be nice to conclude with an answer to, to Jeff's question about the, the, the English language future of this wonderful book. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, this, um, I, there's so much to say about it, and I, I would have so many questions to you, uh, to all of you. Um, I, I think um, I always wonder if, I, if I, I listen to, or if I read the New York Times, or if I listen to um, uh, these great um, uh, podcasts from the United States, most of them are liberal or left-winged, um, but also some conservatives. Um, and and the, this 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 feeling of um, self trust and and the the, the problems to um, for self criticizing and and for reforming um, and I think Europe really learned um, after 1945 that um, that that nothing is self evident and that we are not the greatest nation and for example I'm always very irritated that that somebody like uh, Michelle Obama says. <laughs> We are the greatest nation, and I think this is kind of childish. And after the 20th century, how can you say that? And and um, and of course, I know there's a lot of criticism and a lot of research going on in the United States about the United um, uh, States history. But in in, in 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 the public sphere and in the discourse, it's I, I think um, the United States really has a problem to um, to reform um, um, its democracy and to to really. Um, um, see that there's a ne necessity to do it and not to think um, about itself, about we are the greatest democracy and, and we are great because we can and, and um, because we also criticize ourselves and, 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 and in the end everything is, is, um, is okay. But really to question oneself what is wrong and really to make um, strong um, uh, reforms. I, this is this is I I would very much like to hear what you say about that, but I think there is not the, the mentality um, and not the spirit of um, of self criticism, or it's not enough to to deal with with the problems of the twenty first century. I hope I'm wrong. I I I, I feel very strongly uh, transatlantic, and I feel and, and I really love the United States, and I, since I was the first time in the United States as a teenager, um, but but I. I it, also, from the, from my dealing with the United with the history of the United States, I think it's um, it, it, yeah, there's not um, it, not enough culture of self um, questioning. Well, it's of course a shock to hear that we may not be the greatest uh, nation, but they're very helpful <laughs> helpful cautionary words. But just by way of very conclusion answer to Jeff's question about where things stand with the with the book and where it may travel across national borders. Yeah, it's, um, um, uh, Oxford, um, um. OUP, um, Britain, um, they showed interest, and but it's not yet, um, it's it's it, it, it's not yet clear if it if it if it will work or not. Well, so, so perhaps much, you so can much. also say some sentences, Michael. You, you yes, no, I mean it, we have been. I've been trying to help out if anybody on this call has ideas about ways to do this. That would be that would be delightful. I think it would. I think it would be a huge success as a as a book in the English language, uh, in addition to all of the many other things it would contribute to debates about democracy and about Germany and 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 and, and the public sphere. So, um, you know, I'll just conclude on the note that uh, it's a very remarkable book, and I'm delighted that you've gotten the chance to gain access to it in this format. And we'll simply hope that there will be other ways in which the book may come, the book may come to you, or you know, the arguments and and the wonderful research behind it. But thank you so much, Jeff, for giving us the chance to to talk about it with this wonderful with this wonderful audience. Yeah, thank you so so much for your interest and for the opportunity to present my book and talk about it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.